Hello everyone. Welcome to how to identify your critical open source dependencies and why you really should do so. My name is Julia Ferrioli and I work at the Google Open Source Programs Office. I recently had the occasion to dig into how we use open source software and realized that we didn't really have a good way of thinking about our open source dependencies in an analytical way. This talk will share some of the thought processes and methodologies that I wound up using so that you can go back to your own companies and projects to examine your open source usage. So hi, again, this is me. I say that I've been using open source software as long as I've been using computers because, well, I don't predate the open source software movement. All of the software I've ever used is either open source itself or is built on top of open source software. I call myself an open source archaeologist, not only because archaeology was my first love, but also because I dig around in systems to discover how, where, and why open source is used. I even have some digital toothbrushes and combs that I've built over the years to detect the minute traces. We're here, or virtually here, at State of the Source, a conference dedicated to free and open source software. Some of us are here because we create it, some of us use it, some productionize it, and some do all three. Open source has, well, not one, because I don't think of it in terms of winning and losing, but it's undeniable that it's become a fact of life in industries far and wide. And that's proven out by the data. The new stack ran a study on open source programs offices, and they came out with some interesting numbers. As one might expect, an overwhelming majority use open source software internally. And this can mean anything from open source business applications to web servers to really anything. Up to 83% use open source and commercial products. This means that they're actively building upon open source to create services and applications from which they profit. Another way of looking at it came out of the Linux Foundation supply chain research. 70 to 90% and that lower bound is super important. So 70 to 90% of code for software these days is open source. That means that only a small percentage of code is pulling it all together with proprietary code. So yeah, Technology runs on open source. I've linked both of those studies, by the way, at the bottom. Uh, I highly recommend that you check them out. Uh, there's so much more in there than is on this slide. So technology runs on open source. This is awesome, right? It's kind of a leading question. We are at an open source conference. We're supposed to say yes. But honestly, this is only mostly great. That Linux Foundation research found that, yes, open source is heavily used in commercial software, but they also found that companies heavily use outdated versions of open source. That they use open source that's understaffed, have known security vulnerabilities, and other problematic practices. And if you ask me, that is cause for concern. It just so happened that XKCD recently published in, in August a comic that I just had to put into this presentation after a number of people sent it to me knowing about this presentation. But I felt obligated because this is basically my open source nightmare. <laughs> the alt text for this comic, uh, which is a, a series of blocks, precarious 
deeply placed on top of each other, saying all modern digital infrastructure, says that someday image magic will finally break for good and we'll have a long period of scrambling as we try to reassemble civilization from the rubble. Ah, image magic, you power so much. So when I think about our open source dependencies, I really feel the need to have a, to gain a deep understanding of them. And I like to think of it in terms of the three S's, security, sustainability, and stability. All of those are interrelated. Are we picking up the latest fixes or are we potentially introducing a security vulnerability into our production systems? Do we choose open source software that will be around for a while? And does it have a broad contributor base to ensure the longevity of the project? And finally, are we helping them maintain stability by upstreaming fixes as we have them? But to work to the betterment of security, sustainability, and stability, we have to better understand our open source dependencies. And that's actually quite hard to do. Many companies perform due diligence to satisfy things like license compatibility, the reporting mandates that open source licenses require, and doing some variety of security scanning to ensure that we're not importing vulnerable code. The requirements are here are to ensure that our production systems are stable, that we're building good products, and that we're not violating license terms, aka not opening us up to a lawsuit but it's the bare minimum. We can do more by digging a little deeper. So let's take on the harder task of really understanding our open source dependencies. Doing so might seem like a big investment in the short term, but will help us and the ecosystems that power our products over the long term. The first thought I had when tackling the problem of evaluating our open source dependencies was, well, I'll just compile a list of the projects most used by Google Code. You can't see me because this is a recording, but I'm, I'm grimacing to myself remembering this because I was so naive. This is far easier said than done. Luckily, a colleague had started down this path already, and I was able to build on his work. Some metrics that we considered started from the most simplistic, the binary, have we imported the project into our internal systems or not, to more complex, like examining how often that project is used by proprietary code, or how much CPU time is spent running open source code. If you're performing this analysis with a specific goal in mind, that will probably lead you down a custom path based on your needs. But I did say that I was naive. There are actually some pretty significant problems with these approaches. The first, it's rather lopsided. By that, I mean that if you choose to measure based on CPU usage, that'll bias your analysis to projects performing heavy computations. If you measure based on dependencies, you'll likely see a lot of JavaScript projects popping up for some reason. And all of these approaches will give you messy data that are distinctly one-dimensional. So what do we really need? we need a much more nuanced approach than approaching everything with a hammer and hoping we find a nail. One thing is for certain, we can't treat all open source dependencies the same or else it's like fitting a square peg in a round hole. 
each piece of open source software has a unique shape and we can start thinking about them in broad strokes. And it just so happens that some smart folks have already thought about this and I was able to crib some notes from them. We can loosely categorize open source projects into these five buckets, frameworks, languages, libraries, databases, and web and application servers. These categories came from the Roads and Bridges report, which I've linked at the bottom of this slide. Again, a lot more content in there than just these categories. Highly recommend you check it out. So if we consider these categories as separate buckets to evaluate independently, then we ensure that we get a cross section of our dependencies instead of getting one type of dependency that overshadows all others. We could come up with a set of criteria that are different for each category that take into account their unique characteristics, their unique shape. It can be customized to what you want to dig into. And once we've ranked our dependencies within a category, we can keep them separate or combine them into one ultimate list. I used all of these categories, but you might find that you are only interested in a subset or different categories altogether. There's just one thing missing now that we have a set of categories figuring out how to rank within a category. So we've kind of just kicked the measurement can down the road a little bit, and now we have to deal with it. I wanted to work with cold, hard usage data. I was pretty set on that. Um, I deal better with the numbers than with qualitative factors. So uh, this was my comfort zone. So since I wanted to work with data, I explored what I could get. I settled on a combination of CPU load and how much code depended on individual open source libraries. These we had to separate out because there's code that depends on open source projects directly and there's code that depends on projects transitively code that depends on code that depends on a project. You may find that there are other factors that you'd like to incorporate into your own analysis. Heads up, this is where math comes into play. I didn't want to count each factor equally. First, in the case of dependencies, uh, direct dependencies and indirect dependencies, one includes the other. And then, ag there, then again, there's also the fact that some factors are just more important than others. So what I came up with was a weighting factor, a weighting matrix. I would rank projects within a category by each factor. This would give me an integer one through n then I'd multiply that integer by a weight, which would give me a score for that factor. The overall score would sum up all the scores for each factor, and then we'd get a ranking for each project. I'm going to make this more concrete with an example. It is, however, an entirely contrived example. I picked these three li libraries out of a hat um, and all of the numbers you see on the screen are completely made up. It's like, who's open source is it anyway? The game is made up and the points don't matter. So I've got four factors, CPU cycles, direct dependencies, indirect dependencies, and a wild factor to stand in for something I don't know yet. And I'm going to attempt to rank FFmpeg 
OpenSSL and LA pack or law pack. I've decided that for my analysis, CPU cycles were the most important, and I reflected this by giving it a 0.6 weight. Direct dependencies are more important to me than indirect ones, and the wild factor has the same weight as the indirect dependencies. Now we get to apply our weighting matrix to the ranks. Notice that the numbers on the left of the equal sign for each factor is either one, two, or three. That's the library's rank for the factor. Now there could be ties for a rank, but for clarity's sake, I made it not the case here. So once we have the rank per factor, we multiply those numbers by the factor's weight to get its score. Add all of it up per library to get its total score. So in this example, LawPack is ranked first, the lowest number, and then FFmpeg, and finally OpenSSL. This makes sense because LawPack is a library for linear algebra computation, and we've got a bunch of matrices that we operate on. Therefore, its rank for factors one through three were at the top. FFmpeg might look like the underdog here. It looks like it's at the bottom, right? Only twos and threes for scores, but it beat out OpenSSL for CPU cycles, and we weighted that the most heavily, which wound up giving it an edge over OpenSSL. Again, these weights are totally customizable for whatever you want to prioritize. You can make guesses at the outset and iterate um, based on what you see in your results. It's a combination of a concrete methodology and some hefty magic numbers in there. So now that we've ranked a category, we can bring it all together to form a complete story. If we want to form a single list of ranked dependencies, we can use the same approach for ranking within a category. Create a new weight matrix for how heavily you want to count projects from each category. With this category specific weight matrix, you can base it upon how important each category is to you, or even the distribution of projects amongst the categories at large to ensure equal representation in the final combined ranking. You can incorporate feedback at this level as well and adjust your approach over time as your priorities and usage of open source change. What I like about this approach, apart from it involving cold, hard data and matrices, is that it's entirely customizable. You can use different categories, ones that apply to what you are looking to dig into, adjust the weights both within a category and as a whole, and even incorporate qualitative factors. Maybe you pull your product teams to get their views on what open source projects are important to them. Regardless of how you tweak this methodology, what it enables is the best part, giving back to open source. Once you have this list, you can use it to benefit the projects that make your company go. So you've got your critical open source dependencies. What do you do with it? I go back to the time, talent, and treasure model. Time. Can you or someone on your team commit time to helping one of your dependencies run smoothly? Talent. How about lending your talents toward documentation, engineering, or community management? Treasure. At the end of the day, Open source projects need resources, aka money, to run. If you can, give a grant, funding for cloud resources and services, or sponsor development. Time, talent, and treasure. Different ways to give back to those open source dependencies that make our innovations possible. So that's the how and why of identifying your open source dependencies 
I highly encourage you to take a look at your own dependencies and either adapt this framework or create your own. Just like there's no one right way to do open source, there's no one right way to define importance, and there's certainly not one right way to give back. I hope you weren't looking for more prescriptive guidance than that. It's a lot more subtle and nuanced, but it also means it's a lot more customizable to you and your goals. Thanks, y'all. I have to admit, this is a little bit odd for me watching and listening my, to my own presentation. So, um, so I see Kevin's question about if you could use this sort of thing in Tidelift or Open Collective. The weighting is absolutely 100% subjective. I am going to uh, own that. Um, and it, I, I'm not necessarily sure how um, Tidelift or Open Collective would, would use this. I don't know, Kevin, if you want to elaborate on that at all. If you do have like a, if you've automated some, some sort of framework like this, you'd be able to, um, to basically generate reports for each consumer of the data. It, yes, sorry, Kevin, it was Jacob who originally asked. Yes, and, and it would be a way for, for a company to state these are the items that are important to us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dwayne asks, can I talk about any specific examples of how your methodology has informed choices or decisions that we've made within Google's open source programs office? Um, one of the things that has come out of this methodology has been, you know, well, we've been able to um, identify critical open source dependencies for us um, at Google, although uh, with everything that Google does, it would benefit us to break it down even further. Um, but we use this data as a component in to deciding, like, which events to fund, um, development to sponsor, et cetera. Uh, so it's in active use. And I believe um, that some variety of this went into the, um, to how we, how we tackled COVID in open source as well. So I'm switching back and forth between the chat and the shared notes, just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, what is the next part of the work that, I want to dive deeper into. Well, I mean, I think um, a definite weakness in my implementation of this methodology is that I did not incorporate any qualitative factors. So that um, that is something that I I absolutely want to dig into a little bit more. Again totally out of my comfort zone. Um, and we'd have to figure out like what questions to ask people, like how do you normalize, all of those fun things. So um, that's probably what I'd go to next. Okay, so Google has extensive tooling around CPU measurements for projects. For companies that want to get started with that methodology, don't have that kind of tooling. What are some other factors you might encourage them to use? Uh, I feel like, Duane, this is a little bit of a, of a leading question um, from you. <laughs> but um, going back to individual teams and, um, and asking them what project is, if it went away, they would be the most kind of screwed is probably a, a good way to figure out which which projects are, are the most important to your individual product teams. Um, I'm sure others have additional ideas. <laughs> so I, I am not the be all end all for figuring out those factors. Um, I am limited by my own brain. So how do you take into account dependencies that may take fewer CPU cycles but be critical nonetheless? Um, this is where 
how I compensated for for that was with doing transitive and direct dependencies. Um, and that was ex expressly because of, uh, of projects that don't take many CPU cycles, um, but were used by a large portion of projects. Josh had mentioned, it feels like replaceability to be a wait, could be a waiting factor. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. Could um, and I feel like there are a couple of different angles that one could take on the replaceability idea. Um, like, could we easily replace this with uh, another open source product project um, with like dare I say the words, with proprietary code, like, there are all different angles that you could take on, on that particular factor. And I think that puts us to time. Thank you so much, Julia. And thank you, everyone, for your patience and your determination in getting into the session. We appreciate the conversation.